Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the Fruit of City Council meeting. It's uh, now 7.03 p.m. and we're gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. Oh, Deb, would you please call roll? <laughs> yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Purser? Yes. For the record, Councillor Purser is appearing remotely. Councillor Williams? Yes. Uh, Councillor Cry is excused absent. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? All right. Uh, with that, I'd ask you to please stand with us. We're going to do a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. So we'd like to take the opportunity to allow all faiths and beliefs the opportunity for a silent prayer. Thank you. If you please join me in the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we've got an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? Two corrections to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. The first one is uh, Proclamation C the Grand Valley Bike Month and Bike to Work Day proclamation will be accepted by Public Works Director Kimberly Bullen instead of Mark Mancuso. And the uh, Legislative Public Hearing Ordinance 2022-14, second reading. I meant to include that that would be presented by City Planner Henry Hemphill. All right, uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Purser? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right, we're going to move into our proclamations and presentations. Our first proclamation is Teacher Appreciation Week, and uh, Heather is going to read that for us. Whereas Mesa County Valley School District 51 employs 2,815 teachers and staff currently serving 21,315 students in 46 schools throughout the Grand Valley. And whereas teachers work hard in schools throughout the nation every day to provide a safe, high quality and stable learning environment for children. And whereas the education teachers provide has the power to strengthen our economy and our society as a whole by growing students who graduate prepared to become successful members of society and the workplace. And whereas our future is written in schools across the country, and teachers should be held in high public esteem, reflecting the value placed on their skills and abilities and the importance of public education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the, that the Fruita City Council proclaims May 2nd through 6th, 2022, as Teacher Appreciation Week throughout this community, and calls upon all members of our community to express their appreciation for the educators who engage, equip, and empower our learning community today for a limitless tomorrow. All right, thank you, Heather. And we've got uh, um, Executive Director Angela Christensen here. <clears throat> you brought some help with you tonight? Thank you so much. I did bring some help. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know, our uh, Fruita Middle School principal, Jeremiah Johnson, Johnston. So it's very nice to have him here, too. On behalf of the teachers in School District 51, thank you for the significant proclamation. This is the fifth year in a row that we've asked municipalities across Mesa County for an official proclamation. We sincerely appreciate this and we share it all over School District 51 and promote these proclamations to our entire community. Last week, um, School District 51 Foundation hosted our 10th annual White Ice Celebration to recognize our White Ice Award recipients and outstanding academic growth schools. And in my heart, it really key with all of that is highlighting our outstanding academic growth schools. Those are schools that have grown over the course of the year at a significant rate. And the reason I'm sharing that is because I'm pleased to share with all of you and highlight the schools and teachers right here in Fruta who were recognized because there were so many of them, I thought it was worthy of your attention. Um, in middle school math, Fruita Middle School received the Outstanding Academic Growth Award. At the Fruita High School, at, um, for PSAT, that was the Fruita 8-9 out of all of our 8-9s. Um, 
And, and in high school at the SAT level, Fruita Monument High School scored the highest. And, and so we recognize them. In addition, we recognize some outstanding teachers who are right here in Fruita, including Candace Jay at Fruita Middle School, Eliza Wilms at Fruita 89, and Mary Thomas, who welcomes our students at Rimrock Elementary. We also, in recognizing all of them, we um, just want to thank you and appreciate you for the value that you place in public education, because this isn't something that's only done once a year here at Fruit in Fruita. Um, according to what I've heard, you recognize our schools um, about once a month. And so we appreciate that and thank you so much for this proclamation. All right, thank you. Did you want to say anything, Jeremiah? Just thank you so much for your support. It's really appreciated. All right, well, thank you. Well, Heather's got your proclamation, so come on up. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do. All right, our next proclamation uh, is National Public Works Week. And so I've asked Amy to read that for us. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and the public health, quality of high quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Fruta, and whereas these infrastructures, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are federally mandated first responders, and the engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is the, in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Fruita to gain knowledge and maintain ongoing interest, and understanding of the importance of public works, first responders and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association and Canadian Public Works Association, be it now resolved that the city, the Fruita City Council <laughs> does hereby designate the week May 15th through the 21st, 2022, as National Public Works Week and urges all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. All right, thank you, Amy. And we've got our uh, Public Works Director, Kimberly Bullen, here to accept that. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kimberly Bullen, Public Works Director. Um, just wanted to thank Council for recognizing Public Works and uh, approving this proclamation. Um, just wanted to reiterate the fact that the employees of the Public Works Department stand ready to serve the community and maintaining and protecting the critical infrastructure that makes Fruita a great place to live and work. All right, well, thank you. Are well, you going to accept this? <laughs> All right, and our third proclamation is uh, proclaiming uh, Grand Valley Bike Month, and I've asked James to read that for us. All right, month of May as Grand Valley Bike Month and Wednesday. May 4th, 2022 as Bike to Work Day. Whereas Colorado is a premier bicycling state and the city of Fruta offers some of the best bicycling opportunities in the country. And whereas Mesa County has designated May as Bike Month to celebrate bicycling for transportation, fun and health. And whereas bicycling truly adds to Fruta's small town atmosphere by enjoying the experience of fun and freedom of safely riding a bike to work school on errands and for recreation. And whereas the city of Fruta has gained a worldwide reputation as a Mecca for mountain biking and outstanding road riding. 
And whereas the city of Fruta proudly aspires to hold the title of trails capital of the world for its celebrated mountain biking trails on 18 road, the Cocapelli area, and the expansion of the Colorado Riverfront Trail. And whereas bicycling activities and attractions have a positive impact on the city of Fruta's eco economy and tourism industries and stimulates econo economic development by making the area attractive to businesses and citizens who enjoy the outdoors and healthy lifestyles. And whereas creating bicycle friendly communities has been shown to improve citizens health, well being and quality of life to boost community spirit to improve traffic safety and to reduce pollution and congestion. And whereas the city of Fruta will be promoting the following bicycling activities in May. On Wednesday, May 4th, the kickoff bike to work day with free breakfast in Fruta followed with a bike ride along the new weight finding route. Breakfast is provided by Family Health West from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. at the Fruta Civic Center. Enjoy a group ride after breakfast led by the Fruity, Fruita City staff and Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Pick from three different routes, meet by the stage. On Thursday, May 5th, Fruita Middle School is hosting an after school ride open to students, siblings, parents, and the community. On Monday, May 9th, grab lights, bright colors, and funky costumes. Meet at the Fruita Civic Center for bike decorating at 7 p.m. Then get ready to light up the streets at 8 p.m. with a fun, community-minded light-up ride. Now, therefore, we, the Fruita City Council, hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 as Grand Valley Bike Month and Wednesday, May 4th, 2022 as Bike to Work Day in the City of Fruita and call upon all citizens to participate in bicycling activities for the improved health and community well-being. Thank you. Kimberly, you're up. Mark Mancuso, mm -hmm. Bullen Public Works Director, filling in for Mark. He unfortunately, um, or fortunately, had a has a son graduating, and so tonight was a award ceremony that he needed to attend. But he did want me to express um, sincere appreciation for Council's continued support in building a bicycle-friendly community that really fosters the the health of the citizens, and um, just wants to say thank you. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, you did good. Give me the longest one. I know it's a good way to do it. Glad to see our staff fills in for each other. That's always great to see. Um, so with that, we're going to move into our public participation time. Uh, so this section is set aside for the city council to listen to comments uh, by the public regarding items that do not appear on the agenda. Uh, we normally will not take any action on these items. So if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on something not on the agenda, now is the time. You don't have any online? All right, uh, with that, we're gonna close public participation and move into our consent agenda. Uh, so these are items where all conditions or requirements have been agreed to or met prior uh, to the time they come before council for final action. They'll all be approved by one motion. Uh, and so with this one, we're gonna open this up to public comment. Is there anybody that'd like to speak on something on consent agenda? Not seeing anybody online. All right. With that, we're going to close consent agenda uh, to the public comment and bring it back to council. Does that, anybody have any questions or do we have a motion? Move we approve the consent agenda as presented in our packet. Second. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Brayman? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. With that, we've got, uh, we're going to move into our uh, public hearings. Uh, so we've got uh, three quasi-judicial hearings uh, that we're going to start with, and then one legislative hearing. So our first one is a special event uh, liquor permit application, uh, and our uh, deputy city clerk, Deb Woods, is going to be presenting on this one. I guess you've got all three, so. Yes. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Deb Woods, deputy city clerk, presenting a special event permit application submitted by Colorado Plateau Mountain Bike Trail Association, also known as COP MOBA, for the Fruit of Fat Tire Festival. A two day event to be held this weekend, Friday, May 6th. Uh, the permit is uh, requested from 4 to 10 p.m. on Friday and Saturday, May 7th from 2 to 10 p.m. 
the the application uh, was submitted with all the necessary paperwork and the fee for to be granted a special event liquor permit. A diagram in the um, of the proposed licensed premises consists of an area. It will be enclosed with metal fencing and adjacent building walls. Hotmoba volunteers and or additional paid security personnel will monitor the licensed area, including the entrances to ensure that no alcohol leaves or enters the area. And patrons will be monitored for signs of becoming noticeably intoxicated. Hotmoba will check IDs and wristbands. Wristbands will be issued to those who are 21 or over. Through the Chief of Police, Dave Kraus, reviewed COPMOBA's application and issued the statement that there is nothing that would prevent the issuance of the license being requested. Therefore, it is staff's recommendation to the City Council that the application for the special event liquor permit be approved, subject to the following conditions. Number one, the entrance and exit shall be monitored closely and continuously by event staff in order to prevent alcoholic beverages from going into or out of the area. Two, the licensee needs to be aware that they are solely responsible for control of the licensed premises in regards to alcohol possession, consumption, and adherence to state and municipal laws. And number three, all other procedures presented by COPMOBA will be followed. So my recommended motion would be to move to approve the special event liquor permit for COPMOBA to provide the beer garden at Fruit of Fat Tire Festival subject to all the conditions stated by staff. That concludes my presentation and John Howe with COPMOBA is present this evening as the applicant's representative. So I'll turn it over to him for any additional comments he may have. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kincaid and council members. Uh, are there any questions? I don't really have a lot to add to uh, what uh, Ms. Woods presented. So what we normally do is we'll open it up to public comment and then we come back for questions. So if you don't have anything else to add for what she's added, okay, then I'll open this up to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? Any online? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor. All right, with that, we'll close public comment and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Nope. Well, John, this is what, year 25? Is that what they're saying? This is the... It is the 25th uh, 25th event. There's right. a, a, or the, the event has had a couple years hiatus and uh, Kamoba has been the beer uh, concessionaire for the previous two. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, then do we have a motion? Um, I'll go ahead and move that we approve the application for a special events permit for the Colorado Plateau Mountain Bike Trail Association, uh, COPMOBA, uh, to sell beer at the Fruit of Fat, Fat Tire Festival at the 100 South and 100 North block of Mulberry Street on the two dates requested subject to the listed conditions. Second. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Well, thank you, John. Hopefully, you have a great event this weekend. I sure hope so. I think uh, there's a lot of pent up demand. I think, yeah. uh, I know, <laughs> talking to the, uh, <laughs> George and other uh, personnel, they're pretty excited about what's happening. Um, in all likelihood, uh, the funds that we raise at this uh, event will be going towards either the North Fruta Desert construction that is in its, well, it's actually already started, uh, or the other uh, project that is uh, coming up now is the Cocopelli expansion, and we'll uh, likely be funding part of the surveys that go along with the BLM approvals. That sounds great. Keeping it to help uh, benefit uh, through to... well, Thank you, John. That's all you do. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into our second special event liquor permit application. Uh, again, we've got our Deputy City Clerk, Deb Woods, presenting on this. Okay, one down. <laughs> who's counting? By now, huh? <laughs> okay, 
Okay, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'm presenting the special event liquor permit application submitted by the Fruit of Rotary Club for the Partners of Mesa County Cornhole, Cornhole Tournament to be held on Saturday, May 14th from 11.30 to 7 p.m. at Civic Center Memorial Park. The Rotary Club has submitted the fee and all the necessary paperwork for a special events liquor permit. The diagram in your council packet uh, shows the proposed licensed premises, which will be fenced in. And Rotarians will monitor the licensed area, including the entrances to ensure that no alcohol enters or leaves the area. Patrons will be ID'd, issued a wristband and monitored for signs of becoming overly intoxicated. Ruta Chief of Police Dave Krause reviewed the Rotary's application and issued his statement that there's nothing that would prohibit the issuance of the license being requested. It is staff's recommendation to the city council that the application for the special event liquor permit be approved subject to the following conditions. The entrance and exit shall be monitored closely and continuously by event staff in order to prevent alcoholic beverages from going into or out of the area. Uh, the licensee needs to be aware that they're solely responsible for control of the licensed premises and all other procedures presented by the Fruit or Rotary Club will be followed. That concludes my presentation and Rotarian Lou Mudd is present in the audience. Uh, Lou, do you have anything to add? Lou, we could get a stand up, like a cardboard stand up of Lou that we could just put there. Because it's always for a special event permit, always has to come before council before yeah. the special event. But in 15 years, um, I've never had someone else come to the hearing. <laughs> no, anyway, <noticed>. um, <laughs> we appreciate you. <laughs> for a number of years, it was on the consent agenda. And then um, I think because it's a public hearing, it's, it has to be public. So um, I appreciate your consideration on this. Um, this event coming up for the Cornell tournament um, was the first year last year that we tried it. And any funds that we raise uh, at this event goes directly back to partners. So if it's a, if it's a real successful event, um, it'll be successful for partners as well. Um, we just staff it and, and sell beer to the people playing cornhole because you know when you play cornhole you've got a 16 ounce beer and a 16 ounce uh, you're balanced uh, uh, bean bag whatever they call that so uh, <laughs> it has to balance out so that we help with that <laughs> you don't spill much out of the bean bag though <laughs> all right with that we're going to open it up to public comment is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item have you seen any, Shannon? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor. All right, we're going to close public comment and bring it back to council. Are there any questions, comments? I move we approve the application for a special events permit for the Recruiter Rotary Club to serve beer at the Partners of Mesa County Cornhall Tournament fundraiser in Civic Center Memorial Park lo um, located here, May 14th, subject to the following conditions that are listed right there in the packet. One second. Efficient. Councilor Willie. Councillor Miller. Yes. <laughs> Councillor O'Brien. Yes. All right. Councillor Bremen. Yes. Councillor Purser. Yes. Councillor Williams. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. We're going to move into our third public hearing, uh, which is another special event liquor permit. <laughs> Deb, you're up again. We're more. Lou, don't go too far. No. <laughs> All right. So, this is the special event liquor permit application uh, submitted by the Fruit or Rotary Club to provide a beer garden for Mike the Headless Chicken Festival, whose theme this year is Captain Mike. Uh, the Rotary Club submitted all the necessary paperwork and paid the fee. And uh, you can see in the packet, the licensed area uh, that will be enclosed with fencing. Pat patrons will be ID'd, issued a wristband and monitored for signs of becoming overly intoxicated. Rota Chief of Police Dave Krause uh, has no concerns with the Rotary's application, and therefore it is staff's recommendation that the City Council approve the special event liquor permit for the Rotary to provide a beer garden for Mike the Headless Chicken, subject to the conditions listed in your cover sheet. This concludes my presentation, and... <coughs> Um, 
I think we've been serving beer since the Michael Headless Chicken days started up again. Um, when I came on board, they were serving it out of little uh, five gallon pony kegs that were donated by Breckenridge Brewing and Ska Brewing and a few of those. Um, and they had a, a beer garden that was about half the size of this room. Um, over the years, we've expanded a bit. And now the uh, over the years, because we've done such a, a fine job keeping control of the people and we never get that wild of people out here. Um, it's not like the event a little farther out in June. Um, and now it encompasses the entire headless chicken area that's fenced in uh, that the city puts up the fence for. Um, and it's allowed us to serve a lot of uh, variety of product as well. Uh, we'll be serving um, beer brewed by uh, Suds Brothers, uh, cider from the um, Talbots and wine actually we're going to have on tap as well. We've always served it out of boxes and um, found that uh, uh, we can actually serve it out of a keg on, under pressure. And so we'll be serving a couple different kinds of cider, a, a red wine, a white wine, and probably three or four different kinds of beer out of the draft trailer that we rent from the Talbot. So uh, we've really expanded a lot and uh, the city's helped us immensely. This is one of our largest fundraisers of the year for Rotary and 90% uh, of the money that we raise here uh, goes for good projects in town and worldwide. So uh, Rotary is a, a worldwide organization and this really helps fund many of the projects that we do. Thank you, Lou. All right, with that, we're gonna open up this up to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? Shannon, Shannon? Seeing none online, Mr. Mayor. All right, um, with that, we're gonna bring it back to Councilor. Are there any questions or do we have a motion? I move to approve the special event liquor permit application from the Fritter Rotary Club to serve beer at the Mike the, and other products that they listed at Mike the Headless Chicken Festival in Civic Center, Civic Center Memorial Park. We know where that's located and um, subject to the list of conditions provided. Second. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Purser? Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lou, for being here for the last 15 years. We appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. With that, we're going to move into we've got a, one legislative hearing tonight, and it's Ordinance, Ordinance 2022 14, our second reading. And we've got one of our city planners, Henry Hemphill, here to uh, present for us. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of Council, glad to be with you tonight. Um, we'll be giving the staff presentation on ordinance 2022-14, uh, which is an ordinance to vacate a portion of right of way along West Paver Way in uh, Fruta. So the project description, uh, land development application 2022-11 uh, is a request to vacate uh, 38 feet by 450 feet of right-of-way um, along the south side of West Paver Way, which is just south of the Fruita Community Center. Currently, there's 52 feet of right-of-way already improved, which contains curb gutter, sidewalk, and asphalt. Uh, if we look at the circulation plan, uh, it does not recommend anything greater or wider than 52 feet, which obviously uh, is already improved. And so uh, this portion of vacation uh, can be considered through the public hearing process. Uh, the right of way vacated to the west of the property, which you'll see uh, here in uh, next slide, will give uh, a mental map of, of what that includes, but uh, it, was, it was choppy. The vacations of right of way over time were choppy. And uh, so obviously, you know, speed up to 2022. And then we have this in front of us. Uh, the way this ordinance needed to work is uh, a first reading, which is an introduction. So uh, placed on uh, uh, city council agenda and then set a hearing date for obviously tonight. And this is done by uh, state statute, which requires at least 10 days before the first reading and the second reading to happen. So here is uh, an aerial photograph and highlighted there in the orange color are, uh, is a layer in the GIS uh, with regards to vacations of right-of-ways. Uh, you can see there uh, to the north done in 1979, uh, there was quite a bit of right-of-way vacated. And then here on the, on the south portion of West Paver Way, um, 
there's my cursor. So you can see here, it was kind of choppy. And then, uh, you know, we vacated some right away in the 80s, 1982 and in 1991. And so uh, here today, uh, we have this portion now in front of us uh, that is highlighted there. And that's the 38 by 450 feet um, of right away requested for vacation. Uh, here's a zoomed in picture of the improvements uh, survey that was submitted. This is in the packet. And this gives kind of a, a measurement and, a, and an overall view of the location, you know, utilities are spotted and, and surveyed on this. And it gives an idea of what's considered. And so you can see there's an existing uh, road width dedicated to the, to the city of Fruta uh, of 90 feet. And obviously that's not really needed as I mentioned before. Uh, here is a, another uh, graphic that shows a condition of approval for this vacation, which as you've seen in the staff report and in the cover sheet is the retention of a 14 foot multi-purpose easement. This is typically required of all new roadways that are platted that you'll see um, when you see a major subdivision come before you is 14 feet is required along all frontages for utilities. Those would include, you know, your dry utilities like gas and electricity and then charter or cable. So here's an opportunity to retain that 14 feet in case there's a need for the improvements of those utilities. There's a way to actually access it without, you know, compromising some private property rights. You're able to get in and provide those utilities. Here's a zoning map, and, and this is really particular because you can see here uh, overlaid uh, some existing mobile homes in this area that actually do encroach into that platted dedicated right away. And so this does make just a little bit more sense when you start to think about the elements that are currently on the site and how they've acted for a long time. Uh, is this kind of been legal non-conforming structures just built there, placed there, and, and not really you know, talked about until now. So uh, that graphic is, is actually uh, pretty important when considering this. Approval criteria is set forth in section 17.09090, and vacation of public right-of-way may be uh, approved <coughs> upon finding that the vacation will not uh, violate any of these four criteria. And the vacation of right-of-way will not uh, be in violation of any local or state law because it does not create any landlocked parcels, does not negatively affect adjacent properties, does not reduce quality of public services, and does not violate the city's master plan. And so uh, when staff is considering an application like this, those are the criteria we need to consider and make a recommendation to the planning commission, who again makes a recommendation to the city council. And uh, at their uh, April 12th, uh, public meeting, they recommended uh, approval to the city council by a vote of five to zero uh, with no uh, verbal comments made in that hearing and we have not received any written public comments at this time. Uh, but I skipped ahead on a slide, but just for the record, wanna make mention of legal notice. This is a requirement in our code. Uh, there's three outlets for legal notice in case you know there's some folks that miss it um, or uh, aren't looking in the, in the right spot, but the legal notice on the property is supposed to be done 15 days prior to the planning commission meeting that was accomplished 21 days you can see there in the photo uh, that blue sign that we have is uh, we try to make that as conspicuous as possible so when people drive by they can see hey there's something going on here you know if i'm interested i can figure out how to find out in some uh, some information postcards were also sent that's a 350 foot radius uh, that is uh, was accomplished 20 days prior to the planning commission meeting. And as I mentioned before, we have not received any written public comments uh, at this time. And then there's a legal notice in the paper. Uh, that is That was accomplished on March 23rd, uh, 20 days prior to planning commission meeting. So all done uh, within the confines of the code to uh, alert the public of the, the land development application in this area. Uh, and so that uh, to conclude the presentation uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, the staff's recommendation can be found on page 65 of the council packet, and it recommends approval of the proposed vacation of right of way uh, with the condition that we retain a 14 foot multi purpose easement, which has already essentially been accomplished, as you saw in that graphic and written into the ordinance exhibit. And then uh, to uh, verify no utilities located uh, inside or outside of this future multi purpose easement. 
that is to make sure that we fully include any utilities that may or may not be there. Um, and it's uh, our opinion of the uh, applicant's representative that they have, they have uh, uh, surveyed that, they've verified that, um, and the 14 foot mile per purpose easement should be adequate enough for everything that I mentioned earlier. So that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. All right, <clears throat> and we've got uh, applicant's rep representative Ted Chavon here. Did you wanna say anything? Do it after public comment. <clears throat> Thank you, Ted. All right, with that, we're gonna open it up to public comment. Is there anybody that would like to speak on this item? Any online? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor. All right, with that, we're gonna close public comment and bring it back to council. Yeah, are there any questions or comments? I just wanted to, uh say Heather um, noticed in the planning minutes some of the questions that you had and then thank you they were very good questions there was exactly the same questions I was thinking in my head so um, those things have been answered for me any other questions or comments nope. Nope. all right then do we have a motion I move to approve ordinance 2022-14 second reading an ordinance of the city of Fruta, Colorado vacating certain street right of way along West Paper Way located within the city of Fruta with the condition of reserving a 14 foot multi-purpose easement adjacent to the vacated portion of the right of way. I'll second. Yes. I can't hear you anymore if you're talking to me, but yes. <laughs> yeah, she said Councilor Purser. Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to move into our administrative agenda. Uh, so we've got one item on there. It's the Fruit of Growth and Master Plan Update. Um, and as you all know, uh, Mike Bennett is not feeling well tonight, and so he's asked Dan to fill in. And I know Mike, I think, was going to try and at least be online um, if we did have any questions. So uh, with that, Dan, we're going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Just for the record, uh, Dan Karras, Planning Director, City of Fruta. Uh, I think the, the original goal this evening was to uh, cover the comprehensive plan and then some of the applicable master plans that were kind of lagging measures to the comp plan. All within 10 minutes, is that what you said? All within <laughs> Matthew's got the timer, all right. <laughs> no pressure. So I'll really, I'll really try to mow through this, but uh, one of the things that uh, I thought I'd start with is just obviously when we went through the comprehensive plan process, like the council, uh, established a uh, actually fielded applications and established a working group that was going to be a citizen led check in and then you know certainly was going to come in and uh, collaborate with the planning commission and council before any sort of adoption of uh, the fruit in motion comprehensive plan so uh, a pretty lengthy public hearing process but also a pretty lengthy public process probably more so on that front and uh, because the council and you know really active members of the community participated uh, throughout the course of this but again um, you know there's uh, several chapters embedded within this comprehensive plan you see chapter three being land use and growth and economic development as chapter four and then essentially like the goal establishment for uh, the frost plan and for the circulation plan and then for the education, arts, and historic preservation, which is also codified in our in our land use code. So uh, we're not going to cover in in detail, but I think future meetings we will talk about the frost plan and the circulation plan, and uh, our sewer master plan. Uh, uh, and I think you'll have the appropriate people to give those presentations. But it's kind of like the table of contents, so to speak, for uh, all of the uh, the lagging. Uh, uh, master planning that's done, but the plan themes uh, were uh, established in five ma major categories. I'm not going to read them to you 
uh, but just for the sake, this is kind of like, as you flip through the first few pages, this is what you see. Uh, as a result of that, we established a plan vision, which you know, is kind of a part of most uh, land use related uh, applications and then also is, uh, is kind of a stated in, in many of the, uh, the communication documentation that the city engages with residents. And then we go into 13 uh, community values. They don't all necessarily relate to land use per se, but many of them get kind of picked out of the comp plan as we go through approval criteria for specific land use applications. Like any comprehensive plan that is uh, kind of heavy land use, we establish a future land use map. This is what you see here um, that has specific boundaries, one being a, uh, a planning boundary, which is essentially the transition from that manila color to the green color, green color being essentially book cliffs to the monument between 20 Road and 21. And that is what we call the community separator. It is where no development can take place um, under uh, five acres and that no uh, actual urban level infrastructure extends into that area. Part of the impetus of that was to have distinct separations between Grand Junction and Fruta and then Grand Junction and Palisade. So there is a there's a same sort of setup in Palisade, um, similar to Fruta. And then from there, you know, kind of around the sort of mustard colored yellow, we have the urban development boundary. And then along the, uh, along the six and 50 corridor, if you can see my cursor, we've got our uh, C1 zone district and then our C2 zone district being kind of categorized as the Cocopelli. And then that uh, kind of salmon color being the downtown mixed use, the darker purple being the innovation and flex zone, and then the uh, lighter purple being our industrial zoning classification. So uh, not every single comprehensive plan do you establish a zoning map, an official zoning map. Sometimes you're not actually changing any zone districts. You might just be moving boundaries. Uh, but with this effort, since we did bifurcate some, which I will uh, go into at a later slide, we did actually adopt a new official zoning map as a part of this effort. Why I want to uh, kind of bring up the future land use map is we did also uh, want to just share with the council uh, some, some things that we can get on our uh, GIS map. So let me just share my screen one more time. A lot of times there's this uh, kind of, call it a perception, but that is essentially like our uh, you see a uh, kind of transparent or opaque transition from sort of, you know, what is the lower valley or portions of the lower valley and then the city limits. You can see here as we superimpose some layers, our urban development boundary, that is really where that transition from that manila color into the areas that are not within our uh, present municipal boundary are what I would like to consider, what I like to consider sort of our plan for areas. So that's where we plan to grow in into. Um, so you can see some jog outs that uh, have to do with infrastructure planning and then truly that 19 road corridor and that L road corridor east west as being what we call a, a hard edge. So some communities kind of feather their densities as you get to the edge, but uh, we elected um, to propose that was eventually adopted to not do that for reasons that uh, certainly I think are valid, but we have a lot of development that has taken place in and around our edges. This, this map um, or layer in the GIS are all, uh, actually recorded subdivision plats. So you can kind of see as we go within our urban development boundary that we've got platted subdivisions that are on the east side of that boundary. And then we've got platted subdivisions in the county that are north along that boundary. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we weren't establishing rural zone districts or the transition of urban to rural zone districts that caused us to have a leapfrog development pattern where we would have these 
sort of distinct one, two, three, four acre lots. And then because we uh, were planning to serve that with sanitary sewer or urban level infrastructure in the future, that we have to then annex the, those properties that were developed under the county or uh, do what they call kind of like a flagpole annexation along a transportation corridor and then capture areas, giving kind of this sort of separate urban versus rural context that is generally a very expensive way to develop on your edges. So part of the reason why we decided to uh, propose to the planning commission and council and also the community that we have more of a distinct you know, edge to preserve that agricultural feel and have like a very uh, kind of solid break between urban versus rural. Go back to the other slides. Why I think that is important for the purposes of this discussion is we've uh, had a, a pretty long standing relationship with uh, the county where we kind of adopt sort of our edge plans. So they, the rural master plan and then our, our master plan or our comprehensive plan with regards to the future land use being one that uh, we like to sync up. So uh, we adopt what you call a, uh, a 201 boundary, which is our sanitary sewer boundary. And that essentially is how we plan to expand our treatment facility and to be able to absorb new neighborhoods within those planned areas. And so part of the reason for that is this area right here in the Manila is that planning influence area. So the county has adopted essentially a 20110 boundary, which uh, uh, places some minimum lot sizes that are on the outside of our community. So we can have that kind of seamless uh, development pattern where we don't have that choppy um, leapfrog development take place. So during the course of the, uh, the comprehensive plan, we uh, took a look at all of our zoning classifications. One that I wanna highlight here, uh, the downtown mixed use core and outside the core uh, being a plan for 12 dwelling units an acre in the previous uh, land use code and then the observed densities. What what caught our attention and uh, potentially some cause for concern is that the downtown was built out at just a little bit under four dwelling units an acre, uh, which is, I think, concerning for really a small downtown just in general. But the fact that that kind of mirrored our residential zoning classifications, certainly there was some, some feel that we weren't going to be able to provide housing alternatives that would support us as our economy grew. So you can see kind of the calculations that are written in the text there that support that uh, concept that, you know, some changes needed to be proposed and then potentially put before uh, planning commission and council for codification that support a land use pattern that's a little bit more consistent with the way that downtowns traditionally uh, build out that kind of prevent the, the urban sprawl. One of the slides that our consultant that helped us organize the community conversation SE group uh, put before the community, which was met with really quite a bit of uh, response is just some of the consequences, the very generic consequences to sprawl being that like low density single family dwelling units garner a lot of kind of impacts on the community from real estate costs, infrastructure maintenance, just the extension of, of roadways that don't necessarily uh, help the community financially as we grow out on less less people to pay for services that are incredibly costly to maintain. Just sort of this, this kind of loss of place where, you know, folks are relying upon uh, their vehicles to just travel from, you know, really short distances. I think we've all been to places in the United States where they've, they've sort of implemented these strip mall pattern where they have like, you know, big neighborhoods that come in and then they have to have some sort of uh, commercial node in there to support them with, you know, maybe fuel or a little grocery store or a coffee shop or a restaurant, or what have you. And there was a real concern during the course of the comprehensive plan community discussion about like, we don't want to disenfranchise our downtown from our community as a whole. We've got all these trail connections that sort of lead as arteries that are off the transportation network into our 
vibrant downtown. We want people to patronize those businesses and we don't want to create these little commercial nodes all across the community. Why I think that's important is the previous plan. Um, had those commercial nodes and, and not knocking the validity of that concept, but those red circles uh, were essentially indications of where there'd be planned for little strip malls or commercial type uh, activities that would take place along those corridors. So you can see three of them being along 19 Road, some of them being just north of L Road, which if you remember the previous slide, we kind of drew a hard line on L Road. So there, there certainly is a lot of growth activity that's taking place uh, today, but uh, it's always interesting to talk about the fact that we actually reduced our urban development boundary. It didn't actually expand with this recent comprehensive plan uh, process. So you can see like the, area that I'm, I'm talking about right now, that was a plan for area to grow into. And then uh, north along 17 and a half road, that was a plan for area to grow into. And those actually got, those areas got taken out of the plan because there seemed to be a loss of context, you know, with the, with the community core in relationship to growing in that area. So I just wanted to bring that up because there are some pretty significant distinct differences between the future land use map in 2000 and eight, nine, and the one in present day. So, so one of the things that is always uh, a conversation in the urban versus rural context is sort of that edge fight or the edge struggle. Uh, when we surveyed the community with a story map exercise where people could engage online and then did hard to even admit, which is like 40 plus engagement series, there, there seemed to be this uh, association with our urban development boundary that we were just going to sprawl to sort of the quarter lot, you know, acre sort of development patterns. And, and we, would, we would slowly sort of lose that interface between the agricultural sense and then certainly the urban context. One of the things that we proposed uh, was that well, we should draw a pretty distinct line and we should start to allow, think about allowing some, uh, some different types of housing types to go into those areas that supported the, um, the necessary relief to not just continue to grow on our edge all the time and to push some of those, uh, those developments with higher supported densities interior to our core So I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, call your attention to the fact that, you know, we were a little concerned that we had within the city limits in 2019, 500. Down, Janine just put in the chat that she needs to get closer to the mic. I can't, she can't hear Sorry, you. Janine. Uh, one of the things that uh, was concerning for the planning team uh, was that we had close to 578 acres that wasn't developed within our uh, our actual municipal boundary. Uh, and, and we tried to figure out and do a deep dive into our code on like, well, why are we, why are we experiencing all this pressure on you know, 19 road and in other areas and we're not getting any of these uh, kind of larger reserve lots or parcels interior to our community developed. And as a result, you know, I just mentioned this earlier, but like for uh, just for, um, everybody's edification within the urban development boundary, there was about 2,700 uh, planned for additional acres of non-commercial or industrial land that got contracted by over 800 acres to 1,984 of non-commercial or industrial land. So this last, pl this last planning effort actually didn't expand those boundaries that brought those boundaries in, which I think is kind of surprising when you talk to people that feel like, gosh, it seems like all of fruit is under construction right now, but like those areas got brought in and uh, you know, we've been planning for those corridors for quite some time. And I just wanted to make sure that the council was aware that we were just trying to develop on the edge that this planning effort and the code update actually accounted for trying to get more um, 
development activity to take place interiors of the community rather than just continuing to sprawl. This is, a, I just thought I'd uh, throw this in here because this is a statutory requirement. Each community has to have a three mile plan. It's set forth by statute, which essentially means that you can't grow beyond that three miles in any given year. So many communities out West have like, have had large developers come in and just take down massive amounts of acreage. And so uh, one of the things that the Colorado revised statutes uh, comp contemplated is that you know, each community needs to have a, a, a buffer so they don't experience those, uh, those percentage of growth that can't keep up with uh, services that are needed to have a highly functioning community. So that's something that each uh, of our partners all throughout the valley kind of adhere to a little bit different context for the county considering the land mass, but, you know, very similar in Grand Junction, very similar in Powell, probably to a, a lesser scale considering the fact that they're landlocked with the, the Mesa and the, and the book cliffs. So th this, this uh, um, uh, zoning map indicates the, the planning areas that are adopted by the, uh, by the Mesa County commissioners. And so I just thought I'd, I'd put this in here because it really, it mirrors our boundaries that were set forth. So it just kind of memorializes the fact that there's been great cooperation between all the agencies for, for decades. And, and that uh, you know we are you know kind of adhering to each other's uh, long-range planning efforts. Like uh, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, what was maybe a little bit different about this uh, comprehensive plan process is that immediately it transitioned into the um, uh, the contemplation of a of a complete rewrite to the land use code, and then the adoption of a of a official zoning map. This is that official zoning map. Some of the major changes that took place uh, when the council at that time uh, adopted the, uh, the new land use code was the bifurcation between uh, one zoning classification called general commercial into two different commercial zone districts called C1, C2. Uh, it, it certainly seemed to be a, a wide uh, a percentage of, uh, of acknowledgement of the distinct differences between uh, the 6 and 50 corridor and the Cocopelli and the types of development patterns that uh, we've experienced uh, over the last couple of decades. So it seemed prudent to sort of bust those up into two different uh, zoning classifications that have different design standards, lot size minimums, you know, kind of all the sort of land use jargon related stuff that makes sure that we don't kind of take from, you know, the development that we see in the Cocopelli and try to sort of put it someplace else before it fully gets absorbed essentially the concept around that. And then <clears throat> the, the true codification of uh, the, the core versus outside the core uh, where were those that uh, participated uh, in the planning effort, uh, thought that there was some distinct areas that could be developed uh, with uh, different housing uh, variations, but wanted to reserve the fact that we didn't wanna have put that on the outside of what we considered outside of the core but that we wanted to make sure that the highest land uses took place in the core first before that boundary took, uh, started to expand out. You can see that maybe with the uh, kind of the white dashed line or the, the yellow dashed line right there as being the downtown core and then outside of the, the neighborhood commercial over. These were some, uh, some changes that took place with regards to our residential zoning classifications. Um, some of them had to do with density. Some of them had to do with the consolidation from going from a hard edge sort of, or a soft edge community uh, from a long range planning uh, perspective to a hard edge community. So the consolidation of some of our more rural zoning classifications, and then some, some changes with regards to preference type with, with housing, with uh, relationship to our um, residential zoning classifications, which are primarily South Fruita residential and community residential. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions that I get a lot, and I'm almost certain that you all get a lot, is uh, kind of just sort of, geez, like seems like a lot of stuff going on right now, lots of developments happening. But this, this really, I think, is telling, this shows you from 2010 to 2021 um, of new housing units that have been brought to the marketplace. It, contemplates three different product types, one being manufactured home in the gray, and that is essentially being absorbed with the red cliffs. 
uh, filing that was plotted back in 2000s, 1990s, <laughs> frame in there. And, uh, and then <clears throat> the multifamily units, which are uh, captured by the two apartment buildings that are under construction presently. And then with, with what we thought was kind of an interesting sort of trend change from 2018 to 21, granted there's a lot of things that happened in the middle of that with the pandemic, all that stuff, but uh, that, you know, a, sort of a reduction of the, the primary product type that we've seen brought to the market, which is essentially the single family detached home, you know, on a 7,000 square foot lot. So not a complete uh, reversal, but uh, maybe some stabilization with regards to that, at least in 2021. The figure we just run through this real quick, we kind of uh, busted it up into three different areas uh, of some of the pre-application meetings that we've had, some of the uh, current projects that are under construction. Uh, kind of uh, first things first, going through the North Fruta area, current projects, Orchard Ridge, phase three and four is uh, 51 dwelling units. Uh, that is along the uh, 17 and a quarter road corridor, I believe, or 17 uh, road corridor, which is was plotted back in the kind of 2000 to 2008 range and is just finally building out. Um, Village of Country Creek North, which is 12 dwelling units. I think most people are familiar with that. Uh, 55 and up community, that's just an additional 12 dwelling units that's off of an internal local road uh, of that overall development. The, the MUSE was a, a development that went through the, the rezoning pro process and we just kind of categorized that since it wasn't subdivided or hasn't gone through the subdivision process, but uh, that is depicted in that, uh, in that reddish color. And then some of the pre-application meetings that we have uh, uh, been through recently, one being uh, the dwell uh, development that was a PUD, but that is now exploring the idea of going through the conventional straight zone subdivision process. The Patron and Rose Creek, uh, which is this uh, uh, light bluish color. Uh, it's essentially at the intersection of 19 and Otley you know, in the, uh, the northwest corner of that uh, intersectional alignment. And then we haven't really seen much take place with regards to the 1780K uh, and 610s road, but we did have a pre-application meeting and talked about uh, you know, the unit amount that would potentially be supported with the CR zoning classification. And that is this parcel right here. Um, again, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the iron wheel uh, development. The first filing of that is 52 dwelling units. Um, that is uh, along the 19 road corridor in this reddish color. And then the Sycamore Estates is a vacant lot that was on 19 road or on a, a paver uh, in Sycamore and is planned for for nine units. And then we've got the Grand Valley storage, which is a 159 storage units along the six and 50 corridor, which is in this, in this green color. And then I won't just list, I, I just wanna maybe list those out. I don't necessarily wanna uh, go through each one of those, but those are the pre-application meetings. And some of those are really in various uh, stages of the planning process. They're not um, necessarily ones that could be uh, eminent, but uh, I think it's prudent to at least put that on the radar. And then in the South Fruta area, uh, the current projects being the RV resort, which is in this greenish color, the Raptor uh, Crossing R RV Park, which is uh, along Raptor Road, just to the east of the lagoons. I mentioned earlier the Red Cliffs uh, area. There's uh, a PUD that recently got approved. Uh, that we haven't seen the construction drawings yet for for that, but that's eight dwelling units. Uh, Cider Mills Estate, which was a, a property that was owned by the uh, by the school district for the longest time that was sold. And uh, that is um, this parcel right here. And then uh, I think most people are familiar with uh, the, the two apartment buildings, one on Mesa and one on Mulberry and uh, the Grand Sky Apartments that are um, you know, really not even visible. I'm certain for you, but, uh, um, uh, but just to mention a, a, a few, and then the residences at Fruta being the 50 uh, rental apartments, and then a couple uh, pre-application meetings, uh, the car barn, and uh, the potential of, a, of an additional 10,000 square foot medical office building in the Cocopelli, and then I, I run out of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> 
I figured I'd, I'd throw this out there. This isn't necessarily the, uh, the specifics with regards to Fruta's population that is on the left of the screen, but this is the county's projected population growth increase from 2000 to, to 2050. This data was derived from the Department of Local Affairs. They analyzed census data and a lot of the areas that are experiencing a lot of speculation, and then they they kind of do their, do their math and uh, they come up with projections. These are not an, an exact science by any stretch of the imagination, get recalibrated almost annually, but uh, it's been no secret since you know 2016 that uh, the Grand Valley in general was going to be an area that was going to experience a lot of growth pressures over the next um, 50 years and then this uh, superimposes the growth projections in relationship to household income, Fruta being uh, the blue and then Mesa County being uh, the green. Uh, highlights from that income distribution I think are interesting from the standpoint that you know we are projected to increase a lot of 75,000 to 100,000 uh, household uh, income earners and then that that sort of uh, black line is is the projection as you superimpose it with the population growth. So it kind of two different income classifications, uh, one being kind of lower income earners, which has always been a little bit conflated in Fruta because of young families. Um, and sort of the, the fact that we've been a little bit of younger community in relationship to Grand Junction, which is not that um, uncommon considering the difference in population. I think I'll just stop there if there's any questions or, you know, observations. I can put a map back up. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? I can't see Janine anymore. Do you have any questions, Janine? We'll throw that one up. Nope, I, I'm, I don't think so. Not right this second. All right. Oh, I think you have any reflections. Uh, I think one of the things that's interesting is just the fact that like the plan for acreage uh, decreased. Is that something that doesn't seem like it could be true considering what, you know, what's going on or the amount of applications or um, is it uh, interesting where the development's taking place? I mean, there's. Well, on that, on that, Dan, on that 2019, it said we had 578 acres that was within downtown area ish do we have an idea of how much is left of that since 2019 is it not gotten doesn't really shrunk very much right okay sure you know the some of that has to do with a lot of the fields mm -hmm. you know, like burn heidi pud where the school is located you know i mean that was a was all in the city limits you know the i think most people are familiar with the, the vista valley third phase of that PUD, which is along Pine and Otley, you know, that field. So some of that uh, gets annexed as a result of other developments, but doesn't get developed because it was the parting off family farm or something like that. And that family has still retained the farm. So I don't think that it's uh, wise to think that that's all so developable right now. Okay. But it does, it does provide some context that it'd be concerning if that number got a lot larger even this ends within the city limits. Uh, we think about it through the context of like, how do you get the roads built? Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a lot of undeveloped land that's within your municipal boundary, it becomes very difficult to plan to extend sewer lines, water lines, and, and build the, the required transportation grid to, to get everybody moving sure. and around. I, I'm wondering if it might be possible at some point to have a driving tour kind of of what those kind of last three slides that you just went through with us, the north and south and all of the upcoming or in current process, like to actually see it and have a little description of what kind of units, there's 45, what kind are they gonna be, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You mean an e-bike tour? And tour? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it would be nice to, to know what That'd price be hard points to hear, they're going to. Yeah. 
like what price points they're going to be into because i know obviously we're trying to address housing and overall general but it'd be kind of nice to know what are going to hit certain yeah. demographics and things 100%. like that just so we can kind of have an idea of where Maybe where we are yeah yeah exactly yes. i think it's probably more density isn't it like which ones may be more dense than others because i think that's what's going to affect pricing right we can't we right. don't set the price yeah we can't but i mean we can we can go this is probably gonna land because the ones that are on uh oh, what is it right by the right by the reed park mulberry. is that mulberry? mulberry apartment so you know it seems like they're smaller units and they would be nice you know to get some of these younger families in but from what i'm hearing they're pretty expensive so just kind of just for curiosity's sake, it'd be nice to know where some of the things are going to land. Oh, absolutely. I think most most developers are reluctant uh, to get sure. information because they can't stand behind it or like stand behind it in the sense that no idea what stuff's going to cost. But I think they, maybe from us for us, it'd be like, what do you think? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And obviously, we don't. We're not going to go. Nope, Dan said. But you, you know, just so we could kind of have an idea kind of see what works or like are are we achieving like yeah the goals of like a variety of housing is getting us you know yeah exactly alternatives for the young family uh, which we might have to look a little bit in the rear view mirror on that but um but i think that you know over time like we're either we're either proving that concept or we're not you know so i think that's a uh I think that's good feedback. We should. Well, I think when you're talking about that, proving it, we looked at the little pods and that was approved in the last ones when we realized that it wasn't working because there are so many different little pods that were set for commercial that we're never going to get developed because we didn't have enough density around them to support them. And I think that was the main finding, wasn't it, Dan, that there just wasn't, we're not a big enough community to support all these commercial pods. Yeah. And, and um, the other thing is that the, a, a lot of uh, planned unit developments took place in the 2000 to 2008 timeframe. And those commercial nodes, I think, kind of popped up as a result of proving like the community benefit to justifying some of those densities. Uh, the, the council at that time, uh, uh, you being a, a member of it, with the community mixed use zone, tried to uh, do some of the, the density offerings in relationship to getting amenities. And so one of the things about the mm. uh, land development code that I think has been really wise over time is that like we're willing to do the, uh, the increase in density uh, in the residential zoning classifications, but it's got to be to advance like our trail network or to advance the preservation of open space. And, and I think that as we've, you know, changed the density bonus criteria a, a few times right <laughs> over, over the last uh, uh, few years i think we're getting closer to trying to figure out what exactly are those amenities and you know housing is certainly a part of that conversation um, because i don't think we should abandon like the the sort of free market development and not consider that as a part of advancing affordability uh, for people in all different income brackets, but uh, but we haven't seen we haven't seen a big enough sample size, right? To know if if, uh, if that's working or not. One last thing, and this is really uh, I did I did none of this. Um, Ciara did. You can blame it on Mike. He's not here. Well, he's listening, so we better be behave tonight. <laughs> But uh, um, so so the uh, the city staff has been planning on doing a uh, a city link that is in relationship to growth, not necessarily to um, uh, to to try and get a particular point across, but just to sort of like widen out the the sort of year ranges in relationship to what we're experiencing now. And, uh, and provide a little context with some of the planning practices that we've put in place. So um, again, this looks beautiful. I was gonna say the bottom of that page looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I believe that uh, 
that Mike had made mention that there'd be kind of the front page would be the, the results of the election and, um, and uh, some of the different ways to, to connect on social media with the expansion of the next door and some of the other uh, social media platforms that uh, the city's planning on participating in. And then of course, like everybody in unison smiling bottom there except for james clearly we need some new headshots wait that's smiling you just thought this let's let's zoom in on that smile. yeah <laughs> clearly we need new headshots yeah. <clears throat> that'll be one thing i'll bring up when council reports is getting new headshots because we always do that for new council too deb uh, sent us a did you link get one that already, she was working yeah, she's on already it. on top of it deb is on top of it she, yeah she was already trying to prompt us that way <laughs> well after she saw your photo not smiling oh yeah it's all my fault a new no, I would like a new headshot though. <laughs> He's a whole new man. So part of part of the purpose of putting this in front of you is just to get some initial reactions on, you know, that this is essentially the, the plan for a draft to go out. And, you know, just want to make sure we uh, touch base with council and see if like, you know, we're hitting kind of some of the things that, that maybe you all are hearing or uh, things that you think would be beneficial to provide context for our community. Um, certainly, I think that the, the yearly population growth rate is one of those, you know, having experienced a lot of growth in 2000 to 2008. Uh, and then Can you make that bigger? Yeah, that is. Uh, okay, good. Because so I'm like, blown can away. anybody else read that? <laughs> I would ex a question, Dan, because the questions I get is like, Thank you. what's the city doing about all the growth? And so does it explain like, here are our boundaries and we want to fill this in. And then this, I mean, that's what we need people to. Well, I think the other side of it is that graph so shows a yearly population growth. Everybody's, oh, there's so many people are moving here. Well, no, yeah, it happened in 98 to 2007, sure you know. Like that's, that's so weird. But it is a percentage too. So if really we doubled our size, oh, okay. so we doubled so our size from 98 to 06, 07. So okay. as that percentage goes. To council member uh, Williams point though, I think that there's also a little bit of like, I see a lot of blue signs. Mm -hmm. you know, so a lot maybe, of construction. maybe some of those things haven't happened yet, but it sure seems like they're happening. So somebody explain it to me, I think is kind of the, I, I'm speculating, but I think that that's also a part of it. But, uh, but, but even those projects that we went through don't represent what we experienced in 2000 to 2008. So some of the title uh, 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 points in here are certainly like fruit is growth since 98, like kind of what are we doing uh, to manage that? How did we address that in the land use code? And what was the rationale between like the hard edge and the soft edge? And, I think we did a, 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 a good job, and by we, I mean Ciara, uh, <laughs> uh, did a fantastic job explaining that. And I think that you know, hopefully most will uh, be able to understand some of the complexities with those planning principles and you know, learn a little bit about the buffer, learn a, bit, a little bit about the city limits and the, uh, and the urban growth boundary and how they haven't changed much over time. And uh, that we still have a lot of filling in to do. And so I, I think she did a tremendous job. Um, so is she posting that on the uh, fruit of message board? Yeah. <laughs> is this a, well that you said this will be a link that we can so like we can share this? Will this go out physically? Like will this be a mail out? Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Do you know how many uh, dwelling units are planning on coming online within the next 12, 24, and 36 months? Not that number, but the numbers that I uh, I showed you represent the five to seven and that's about 902 units. Okay. And do we have uh, any areas that are designated as opportunity zones that are encouraging? Now, how do we do that? Can we, cause that would, cause I know speaking to some folks that were building in Grand Junction, the reason that they're building the condos that they're building is because they're in opportunity zones. That encourages local builders to get in there, right? It does. Uh, Wasn't that be kind of cool for us to get in? I don't know that process, but I definitely wanted to bring that up to you at some point. And I feel like this might be the time. This is, yeah, for sure. The, the When I first started, um, I remember at that point in time, Senator uh, Cory Gardner was a huge player in getting the opportunity zones established that are based off of census tracts. Okay. And it's really, really odd about that. And it's not trying to throw any stones. Uh, but like, you know, the, the sort of description of the 
opportunity zones were meant for, which talked a lot about sort of rural communities and you know, helping them develop out and getting you know, some of the things that I'm sure their long range planning efforts had so desired for, for many years, uh, captured a lot of census tracts in Grand Junction, but no sense kind of left us out. Ruta. And so we brought that up, you know, when uh, when we uh, talked to Senator Gardner, and uh, I think that there there was some shared like, gosh, like Fruta is a rural. Community. Yeah, more so. It seems like they fit that description, <laughs> really pretty pretty much like a glove, but but we're not included. In is there that. things that we can do to fall into those? How do you get the designation of opportunity zones? Who designates them? So the um, the state does. The, the state, state does. does, okay. So you have to petition, or how do we go about yeah, looking at a, that? The, the, <laughs> but the like, so the federal, the federal government census tracts, and then the state, like, like that, it, it's it comes down, you know. Okay. And the census tracts. So you just have to hope that they look our way and shine our way, huh? It, it certainly seems that way, you know. I, and those tax breaks come at what level? That's county. I believe. I, I'm not 100% certain. I thought there were county. Yeah, that's what I, I thought it was. Came from. I thought that the county was who could even say they they were. That's why I'm, that's why I'm asking more I know about that it. There were property tax um, components associated with that, but maybe at a, you know, I'm not sure if we're going to be competitive for the opportunity zones or not. We can certainly, you know, take that back and talk about it as a staff and clue Mike into that, um, into that uh, equation. But there are other financial um, models that maybe we could present on as well. You know, that hey, Dan. Potentially get us there. Hey, he, he hey, lives. He is, well, hey, he lives. I, I live. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I could, I could just add a little bit to that. Um, unfortunately, it's not something we, we've tried many times uh, as, as far as the opportunity zones go. Um, the federal government created all the tracks and then they sent to the states um, a map of those tracks and then the states were had to break those down into half and we were never even on even the first round from the federal government and it's typically it was based on levels of income levels of pricing of housing and those types of things. So kind of what Dan had mentioned is, is completely true. Um, it almost seemed a little bit surprising to Senator Gardner when I was explaining that to him because he felt like Fruta was what we, what they were planning for these tracks. But we've had, we've had GJAP, we've had senators, we've had, we've kind of reached out to everybody to try and get that change, but they don't, it's not like an ongoing process that they have, and we've really we've really gotten no no uh, traction on that in any way. It was kind of a one time. Now there, mm. we keep bringing it up when we every time we talk with senators' offices. So if there's a new opportunity for them to create that, because you're right, James, it's a it's a great incentive. It it, it definitely uh, drives some of the development in uh, that, that we're seeing even in the valley. Uh, because of an opportunity yeah but, but we've also and mike knows this better than i do we've we've uh, struggled to keep some of our usda rural development loan classifications and a lot of that has to do with income and so we fought pretty hard to keep those uh, those tools uh, at our disposal but um, but because of income and uh, probably a little bit speculating here kind of the product that we've put out there is just single family detached homes and the price points that those are at uh, don't necessarily lend themselves to the incomes that sort of back up the opportunity zone, US right. loan, all that. So, so there's been, I think some policy part of that story, but there's also, you know, been a, geez, like, seems like we fit like a glove. Like, why are we not included in the we just were we weren't building the product at that that time. We that wasn't our need though, really. And now we're seeing that that is our need now. Oh, for sure. I mean, there was a sure talking to uh, uh, Councilmember Miller about this, where it's like for the longest time, and you know, it's been widely known that like this was the place to go, you know, when you needed more entry level product, but uh, and and you had a young family, maybe you weren't competitive for some of the other things at your disposal across the valley. 
uh, and that just has really shifted over time with you know data that you've all seen, you know, and, and graphs that you've all seen with the housing price points where they're at. We're victims of our own success. Fortunately, I think that is how a lot of that goes. Sure. We got to be less cool. We can still be cool. We just yeah. No, no, we just got to act like we're not. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Dan on this one? Is it, po well, is it possible for us to get a preview link of that before that goes public so we can review it? Because I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't really read it. No, that's, that, I want to do a deeper dive for sure. I always say we in the past we've never got into the weeds. We let the staff do it, but if you guys want to dive into the weeds, I would love you're to welcome read it to do before that. it comes out. So when it comes out, I can be prepared. Right. It looks it just, great it's, though, Sierra. Nice. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It it just seems like that right there is is I almost want to print that on out. our desk you know, right now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I know you're gonna mail it, but still. Yeah. yeah. Here you go. Here you go. And sign it. Yeah. Autograph. Yeah. <laughs> you could get it notarized. All right. No, and that too, Dan. <laughs> I get that as an edible PDF. <laughs> Deb, can, Deb can notarize it for you, and we'd be all set. So, can we show what it's uh, designated like city property that a city actually owns the property of? It, in there too, can we have that as a separate unit? Absolutely. Just so we can see what we can do with certain spots. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dan. All right. Slightly over 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> That's all right. That was very important. 50 minutes. Is that okay? I think he's still shorter than Mike. I think he, I think Mike would have. <laughs> no, Mike's up next. City manager's report. I don't know if Mike's reporting anything or if he gave it over to Shannon to report. <laughs> Shannon's like, no. I, I, do, I do not have anything. All right. Well, hopefully you get feeling better. We're going to move into our council reports and actions. Um, for, well, I, I actually, I should have said this, but we usually do go around the room and say if we have any updates for council i'm going to do that between a and b because once we go into executive session we won't come out and do that so uh first one is mesa county commissioners request to meet um so uh that was the one uh, let me get to that now i gotta because i just want to look at the dates for that it's 90 yeah, because um, last year they did the town hall, and I know some of you, Matthew, was here for that, for the town hall. Weren't you here for the town hall yeah. last year? Yeah. You got called up uh, right. up here, which you were so happy about. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this year we may do mayor pro tem on that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm good. Um, what was the date on that? Yeah. August 24th. August 24th. Okay. You won't. I won't be here for that. But I think that was more, it was more of a um, kind of a community come in and ask questions. And most of the questions that were came up were not even fruit or related. Um, that was the disappointing part about that whole meeting. Uh, a lot of it at the time was about election. Yep. It was about the, yeah. We, so was it just about doing a town hall or were they wanting to come talk to us? They wanted to get feedback. No, they wanted to get feedback from the community. So it was more of a town hall to bring people in from the community. That was the only one? I thought it was two different. So they did them throughout the community. Yeah. So they did one in Fruta. So this is another one that they're going to do. So that's Wednesday, August 24th. I've got no conflict. Well, is it the 16th. 16th? Isn't the flyer from last year? And the yeah, it that's is. just a flyer from last year. They're asking to come to a city council meeting. Which <laughs> yeah, right. There. Just have a discussion. They wanted to talk with us or address the council. So I guess we would just include it on the agenda. I would think so. August, what did they say, 16th? Yeah, yeah second regular so meeting in wanting, August. They're wanting the town hall to be at the end of one of our regular scheduled meetings. Yeah, so they're not doing a town hall then. Is that what I'm hearing? They just want to come meet. They asked to come to your meeting. Okay. That's I thought. Oh, then that's great. They want to come address the council. <laughs> well, I would put them on on the um, presentations. Presentations at the beginning. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Unless we want to put them at the end on council reports and actions, but I think. We don't want them on the end. Yeah. We want it. We want to We're give them a like, different crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that my outside? All right. So is everybody good with that? Yeah, you did say that a lot. <laughs> Yes, that's fine. We got a thumbs up. All right. All right. Then, yeah, let's get them on for coming to, and we'll put them on the presentation part of that. And then we can ask them why Clifton got a big old huge hall on campus and we didn't. 
Because we've got the community center. We do our own. Shut up. We can just add. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So with that, then uh, we're going to move into our council reports before executive session. So we'll go around. Matthew, do you have anything to? Uh, I've not been to my first Fruit of Chamber uh, meeting yet. Um, GJEP, we put an offer into a gentleman for executive director. He turned it down. So we are going out now for round three of looking for a new executive director. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's been going on for what? Six months? It feels like longer, but yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Janine. Yeah. I got to meet um, with the livability commission and uh, that was super great. What a great group of people. They're going to want to come do a presentation for us here in the near, near future. Just a brief presentation of um, a project that they're getting ready to launch and adopt a street project that um, they're really excited about and that Shannon's been helping them um, get together. And uh, so that's, uh, that's that with them. And then the downtown advisory board had the first fourth Friday and it was rainy and the weather was crazy, but we moved everything into Cavalcade and it still went really well. We still had music outside in a tent and then um, the artists inside and they sold things and had great attendance. So it was really fantastic. All right, thank you. James. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, we had tourism board. Um, it was cool. Um, Denise came in and presented about a, a plan that she had to do how would you say, Shannon, how would you describe it? It's uh, to reprint the historic um, uh, brochures, walking the map, walking yeah. brochures, yeah. So the tourism board approved money for her to do that, which was great. And then she's got another larger project of around town. There's the placards that are in front of kind of telling the story of Fruta. Um, we're trying to push to get, she wants to get like 10 of those done. She got them figured out and designed. So we're... we're moving forward hopefully with that i think it seemed like we we're all pretty much on board it seemed like a pretty cool thing um and then i met uh, i went to the museum board they they're looking for split rail cedar fence the oddest thing ever uh, for riggs <laughs> hill so if anybody has any of that laying around they wanted to just throw that out there that if anybody has that anywhere so if you're in conversation i don't know Apparently they are not funded very well. That's why they are asking for these things. Um, and one of the conversations, and I kind of asked them where their funding came from and they said that their mill levy um, is was worded that it was an up to and 1.3 million and the commissioners can decide what how much they get. They used to um, give them all of it and they stopped doing that and with the auspices that they were going to come back to giving them that. And now they're only giving them about 200 ish. Um, so they that kind of hurts them. That's under the County commission. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe I, that's something to talk about on August yeah. 16th. Though. Yeah. It might yeah. be something because uh, I mean, the, the, that there's those three museums, it's ours. Um, I, I say ours, but the dinosaur museum, um, then there's the one that's downtown grand junction and then the cross orchards, um, but they're hurting for funding. And it was kind of sad to hear that the commissioners can kind of say, just because of the way that that mill levy was written, the wording in it said up to um, 1.3 or whatever it was. And they used to get the full amount and it got pulled back and it never got brought back. So they're frustrated with that. Um, that was me asking them. I didn't bring that up. And uh, we got to go back stage at the dinosaur museum which was really cool i got to touch like t-rex stuff it was cool <laughs> yeah, i enjoyed it all right is that everything but yeah no cedar fencing we need that for the for riggs hill all right amy um i met with the historic preservation um which is that's they we talked about the plaque the placards um, they only have $500 a year for a budget. So, uh, it was really great to partner, you know, that this partnership was proposed, um, to try to fund, you know, some more of these things. Uh, and she has an amazing proposal with the pictures mm -hmm. and, uh, there's 10 additional sites for these signs, um, including like the middle school and Reed park, um, Greta, and uh you know just kind of 
giving a little bit more background on why we have the things that we do. And then they also, we had um, Kayla from the, the chamber was there to, she, she was offering to help um, find sponsors for the coloring book that we, we have talked about the coloring book before. Um, and they were looking for, you know, some funding to print some more of these coloring books to be able to engage with the, the kids and the schools. And so Kayla had come to offer help with that and to get sponsorships for that. So that was pretty cool um, because, you know, the, the amount was pretty doable if you consider, you know, offering it to, to local businesses and giving them a tangible, you know, thing to put their logo on is, is always appealing. So um, yeah, it was really cool. It was neat to meet need to meet with those people and I'm excited. I look forward to being part of that. And then planning and zoning, uh, I will actually be missing the, f the first one is the night of graduation. Um, and I have a kiddo graduating, so I won't ask Heather to fill in for you. <laughs> <laughs> they said, it's okay that, that we, that we, <laughs> that we aren't there for this one. I got, I got the okay to, to miss. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I won't be reporting on that for a little while. But. I saw how quick Heather was ready to volunteer for that. <laughs> All right, Heather, you're up. She already passed the Parks and Rec met last night. Um, Mark Mancuso is a grant man. He's out there just looking for all sorts of grants um, to try to get some other matching grants to, in the house that Jack built for Reed Park and some other things. So um, we'll have more information on that. They had a draft proposal of the fee structures they're reworking the fee structures for like when you when events come and they need to use our facilities and they're um it was it was cut it was very drafty and so the board gave them a lot of advice of like i think you know we're going to want to see this we're going to want to see that so they're going to get another draft give it to the commission or the board or whatever we're called we'll give their advice and then they'll have a, a final draft ready for council um at the june meeting i believe and then the FCC's numbers are coming back really strongly. We're at like 92% of revenues from compared to 2019. So FCC is looking pretty good. So, and then um, I have my first arts and culture board on May 11th, but I have a virtual conference. Janine, did you say you could go to that one for me? Someone, I thought I talked to someone who said that they would go to the arts and culture board that night. Was I dreaming? I think so. Oh, I, I was dreaming. Okay. Never mind. Is, it's good. I'll it? just communicate with them. It's when next Wednesday at 5 30 at the city shops. You sure? Yeah. She'll trade you. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Amy. You're a better wheeler dealer than that. That was you folded. Like I you folded kind of like that for a little more leverage. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Is that that's it? All right. Um, I went to the police commission the day after I was appointed to it, so I was able to make that uh, uh, pretty quick meeting. They were just talking about some of their staffing because um, they had a retirement in the uh, with the police commission, and so they're promoted several, and so now they're still going to look at getting another entry level police officer. So just the staffing needs uh, there. The other thing I got to do um, was the Rimrock Elementary tree planting for Arbor Day. So that's oh, they take uh, the poster contest and then uh, whichever student wins that, then they get a tree planted at their school. And so this is the second one I've got to do at uh, Rimrock. So that's been kind of do you wear a top hat when you go to school? You know, kids book. No, because it's so windy usually that we don't, you know, have to do that. But Art and his crew does a great job of prepping and getting ready, and and then they explain what the tree is and they talk to the kids, and and so it's it's a kind of a fun, it's a quick fun day. But uh, usually the kids get to dump dirt in the hole, but this time it's so windy that they're like, all right, we're just gonna <laughs> let the parks crew do it so so i get to do that as well so that was that's always a fun thing in the community to do um that's all i have as well so with that um we're going to move into our last item which with which is an executive session so it's a discussion and possible action to consider a motion to convene an executive session regarding personnel issues under CRS section 246424F, and it's our municipal court judge uh, informal review. So I'll need a motion to go into executive session. So I'll go ahead. I'll move to meet an executive session for the informational review of the municipal court judge, which is a discussion of a personnel, men, personnel matter under CRS section 24-6-4024F. Second. Councilor Purser. 
Yes. Councilor Williams? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Mr. Mayor, would you like to take a five minute recess or? We can. You're going to, you have a different link for Janine to log into, correct? All right. Yeah. But we'll take a five minute recess and be back here at what time is it? 847.